Good morning, and welcome to the November Almost Turkey Day meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, will you please introduce our agenda today? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you and good morning, commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear seven items for your consideration. First, you will consider a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking to establish a framework to facilitate equal access to broadband internet access service by preventing digital discrimination of access and seek additional comment on matters pertaining to the Commission's administration of Section 60506 of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and our efforts to facilitate equal access. Second, you will consider a report and order that would adopt rules to implement the Safe Connections Act of 2022 to help survivors of domestic violence and similar crimes separate lines from shared mobile accounts that include their abusers, protect the privacy of calls made by survivors to domestic abuse hotlines, and support survivors who face financial hardship through the Commission's affordability programs. Third, you will consider a notice of inquiry seeking to better understand the implications of artificial intelligence technologies as part of the Commission's ongoing efforts to protect consumers from unwanted and illegal telephone calls and text messages under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Fourth, you will consider a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would adopt rules to protect consumers from SIM swap and port out fraud, two fraudulent practices that bad actors use to take control of consumer cell phones, and would also seek comment on whether to harmonize the Commission's existing requirements governing customer access to customer proprietary network information with the new SIM change authentication and protection measures in the report and order. Fifth, you will consider an enforcement action. Sixth, you will consider an enforcement action. And seventh, you will consider an enforcement action. This is your agenda for today. Please note the items listed as five, amending amateur radio rules for greater flexibility in data communications, and six, reducing regulatory requirements for rural providers of long distance, ac distance access service in the November 8th, 2023 Sunshine Notice have been adopted by the Commission and deleted from today's agenda. Today's first item is titled, Preventing Digital Discrimination, and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau, Dewana Terry, Special Advisor to Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Director of Office of Workplace Diversity will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Terry, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Task Force to Prevent Digital Discrimination and the Wireline Competition Bureau are pleased to present for your consideration a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would, if adopted, establish a framework to facilitate equal access to broadband internet access service. The report and order would adopt rules preventing digital discrimination of access consistent with Congress's directive in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The accompanying further notice of proposed rulemaking would seek additional comment on matters pertaining to the Commission's implementation of Section 60506 of the Infrastructure Act. I would like to thank the members of the Task Force to Prevent Digital Discrimination and the Wireline Competition Bureau for their hard work and collaboration, as well as our colleagues in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, the Media Bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. The Office of Communications Business Opportunities, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of International Affairs, the Office of General Counsel, the Office of Workplace Diversity, and the Office of Managing Director for their contributions to this item. Seated at the table with me are Sanford Williams and Alejandro Rourke of the Task Force Leadership Team, and from the Wireline Competition Bureau, Lisa Wilson Edwards, Special Advisor for Digital Equity and Inclusion, Jody May, Chief of the Competition Policy Division, 
Heather Hendrickson, Deputy Division Chief, and Jamie McCoy, an Attorney Advisor in the Competition Policy Division. Jamie will now present the item. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Everyone in the United States, regardless of where they live and who they are, deserves access to robust, high-speed, broadband internet access services for success in today's society. To promote equal access to broadband, Congress tasked the Commission in Section 60506 of the 2021 Bipartisan Infrastructure Law to create rules and policies to address digital discrimination of access based on income level, race, ethnicity, color, religion, or national origin. This report and order is the result of careful review of the substantial administrative record and outreach to community stakeholders over the past two years. The report and order, if adopted, would define digital discrimination of access as policies or practices not justified by genuine issues of economic or technical feasibility that one, differentially impact consumers' access to broadband internet access service based on their income level, race, ethnicity, color, or national origin, or two, are intended to have such differential impact. Second, it would adopt a rule prohibiting digital discrimination of access as defined above. The prohibition would encompass intentionally discriminatory conduct as well as conduct that produces discriminatory effects by covered entities. The prohibition would apply to policies and practices that affect a consumer's ability to have equal access to broadband internet access service as the term equal access is defined in section 60506. This includes, but is not limited to policies and practices affecting deployment, network upgrades, and maintenance. Covered elements of service would include both technical and non-technical elements of service that may affect a consumer's ability to receive and utilize their services. Additionally, the report and order would adopt rules that allow for enforcement of our prohibition against digital discrimination of access through self-initiated commission investigations. When impermissible, discrimination is found to have occurred, the commission would have at its disposal the full range of traditional remedies and penalties. The report and order would revise the commission's informal consumer complaint process to provide a dedicated pathway for accepting digital discrimination of access complaints from consumers and other members of the public including organizations. The dedicated pathway would allow the commission to collect voluntary demographic information from complainants. In addition, the report and order would offer parties voluntary mediation overseen by commission staff when appropriate and would establish a process for industry participants to seek and obtain advisory opinions from commission staff regarding the permissibility of specific policies and practices under the new rules. Lastly, the report and order would adopt the Communications, Equity, and Diversity Council's recommendations that propose model policies and best practices for states, local, and tribal governments to support their efforts in combating digital discrimination of access. The further notice of proposed rulemaking would propose and seek comment on affirmative obligations for broadband providers, including annual reports that would facilitate greater transparency regarding substantial broadband projects recently completed by providers, as well as internal compliance programs that would require periodic evaluation of the demographics of communities served and not served by such recently completed projects, as well as pending and planned projects intended to affect 500 or more households. The further notice also seeks further focused comment about the potential benefits and costs of establishing an Office of Civil Rights within the Commission. 
The Bureau recommends adoption of this report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking and request editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. <clears throat> Thanks. The FCC has historically focused its broadband agenda on connectivity, on coverage, on capacity. The Biden administration's entire approach to the internet, its broadband agenda, if you will, can be boiled down to one single word, control. You can see it with the Biden administration's effort to call on the FCC to impose Title II regulations on the internet. You can see it in the Biden administration's campaign to pressure internet companies into censoring the protected political speech of Americans. You can see it today as the Biden administration has called on the FCC to adopt these digital equity rules, a framework that gives the FCC a nearly limitless power to veto private sector decisions. Now, none of these are isolated decisions. They share in advance the same goal of increasing government control. But it's never enough. Consider this. Democrats have been in control of the FCC and administrative agencies in D.C. for approaching 12 of the last 16 years. And they've had the opportunity over that stretch of time to put in place nearly any federal telecom policy of their choosing. In fact, the federal government has allocated hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars for the purpose of ending the digital divide while Democrats have run the administrative state. After all of that time, after all of that spending, the Biden administration has concluded that the Democrats' policies are not working. And I agree with President Biden on this point. The administration's broadband policies are failing. The costs of building out internet infrastructure in this country have skyrocketed thanks to the Biden administration's inflationary policies. The administration has needlessly blocked and delayed new broadband infrastructure builds. Permitting reform has gone nowhere. The Biden administration is preparing to waste additional taxpayer dollars through its multi-billion dollar Internet for All initiative by pursuing extraneous political goals at the expense of actually connecting Americans. And just this week, the administration confirmed that it has no plan for filling a now empty spectrum pipeline, one that's vital to America's economy and geopolitical leadership. But the Biden administration is taking away all the wrong lessons from its failed policies. Rather than righting the ship, the Biden administration is going hard left. It's now blaming the private sector and free market capitalism itself for the administration's own policy shortfalls. The problem, the administration has apparently concluded, is that up to now, the FCC has failed to exercise enough authority. It's never tried real command and control regulation of the internet before. So last month, President Biden gave the FCC its marching orders. The president called on the FCC to implement a one-page section of the 2021 Infrastructure Act by adopting new rules of breathtaking scope, all in the name of digital equity. And for the first time ever, those rules would give the federal government a roving mandate to micromanage nearly every aspect of how the internet works, from how ISPs allocate capital and where they build, to the services that consumers can purchase, from the profits that ISPs can realize and how they market and advertise services, to the discounts and promotions that consumers can receive. Talk about central planning. Needless to say, Congress never contemplated the sweeping regulatory regime that President Biden asked the FCC to adopt. 
let alone authorize the agency to implement it. Nonetheless, the FCC is voting to put President Biden's plan in place, and I oppose it for several reasons. First off, President Biden's plan hands effective control to the administrative state to veto nearly every decision about the provision of internet service in the country. Never before in the roughly 40-year history of the public internet has the FCC, or any federal agency for that matter, claimed this degree of control over the internet. Indeed, President Biden's plan calls for the FCC to apply a far-reaching set of government controls that the agency has not applied to any technology in the modern era, including Title II common carriers. The closest analog would be the heavy-handed rules the FCC applied to the Ma Bell telephone monopoly during the height of the New Deal era, a period of time when it was hard to distinguish between the government and the private sector. But don't take my word for it. The text of the order itself expressly provides that the FCC would be empowered for the first time to regulate each and every ISP's network infrastructure deployment, network reliability, network upgrades, network maintenance, customer premise equipment, installation, speeds, capacity, latency, data caps, throttling, pricing, promotional rates, late fees, opportunity for equipment rental, installation time, contract renewal terms, service termination fees, and use of customer credit and account history, mandatory arbitration clause, pricing, deposits, discounts, customer service, language options, credit checks, marketing or advertising, contract renewal, upgrades, account termination, transfers to another covered entity, and service suspension. As it as exhausting as it is to read that list, the FCC says that it's not an exhaustive list. The Biden administration's plan empowers the FCC to regulate every aspect of the internet sector for the first time ever. The plan is motivated by an ideology of government control that is not compatible with the fundamental precepts of free market capitalism. But it gets worse. The FCC reserves the right under this plan to regulate both actions and omissions, whether recurring or a single instance. In other words, if you take an action, you may be liable. And if you do nothing, you may be equally liable. There is no path to complying with this standardless regime. It hangs together the same way an M.C. Escher drawing does, on paper only. President Biden's plan also sweeps entire industries within the FCC's jurisdiction for the first time in the agency's 90-year history. Think about that. It'd be one thing if the FCC cabined its intrusive new regime to ISPs or even businesses within the communications sector. It doesn't. The order says that, quote, we're not explicitly tasked with regulating entities outside the communications industry, a rare moment of regulatory humility. But then it goes on to say that the FCC will do so in this case Nonetheless, the moment passed. Landlords are now covered. Construction crews are now covered. Unions are now covered. Marketing agencies are now covered. Banks are now covered. The government itself is now covered. All newly subject to these FCC rules and liable under them for both acts in omissions. Congress never authorized the FCC to regulate all of these entities and industries. So to everyone that will be subject to FCC 
regulation for the first time ever, welcome. I hope you have good lawyers. But one reason those lawyers will be needed is because President Biden's plan allows the FCC to impose unfunded build mandates and unlimited monetary fines on every covered entity. Section 6506 doesn't authorize the commission to create or enforce new punitive liability rules or compel builds. Instead, it directs the FCC to facilitate equal access to broadband. Nonetheless, the item determines that the agency will apply the full suite of the commission's enforcement powers to any act or omission that violates its new rules. This means that ISPs could very well be compelled to build out internet infrastructure without any compensation. And every decision from the C-suite down to the call center will be subject to FCC second guessing. In this regard, the order's approach runs afoul of several limits Congress imposed on the FCC's enforcement authority, which I get into more detail in in a written statement. But these are not the only lines the FCC crosses today. Despite the repeated refrain that the agency has no interest in regulating broadband rates, the Commission votes today to regulate broadband rates. This comes on the heels of last month's meeting, <clears throat> where at the 11th hour, the FCC slightly softened its proposal to use Title II to impose price controls. Now we know why. The order before us today expressly states that the FCC can regulate broadband pricing and even an ISP's profitability. Title II is no longer necessary to achieve those ends. But as a legal matter, the statute's clear. Congress did not include the word price or the term rate regulation in the text of Section 6506, nor does it reference affordability. Instead, Congress chose to use the phrase terms and conditions. It's clear that Congress used that phrase as opposed to rates, terms, and conditions because Congress decided not to give the FCC rate regulation authority in this statute. The Communications Act and the FCC's own rules and precedent confirm this point. In the Communications Act, Congress routinely distinguishes between rates on the one hand and terms and conditions on the other. In the limited set of circumstances in which Congress has wanted the FCC to exercise rate regulation authority, it's stated so clearly. Here's just one example. The 1992 Cable Act, Congress expressly directed the Commission to regulate the rates of cable service tiers. But seeing the results that flowed from that express delegation, Congress thought better of it in the 1996 Act and strip the FCC of that rate regulation authority. Given that Congress raked back an earlier, narrower, and express delegation of rate regulating authority, the FCC has no basis for concluding here that Congress chose to give us more expansive rate regulation authority through an implicit delegation. In other words, the FCC's conclusion that Congress provided the agency with the strong medicine of rate regulating authority, not only sub silentio, but through a phrase that is ordinarily read as denying rate regulation authority, stretches any reasonable theory of statutory interpretation well past its breaking point. Now, the legal errors only compound from there. For instance, the order rolls back decades of considered commission precedent without so much as acknowledging those decisions, let alone providing a reasoned explanation for departure as required by the APA. So I talk in even greater length in my written statement. Uh, Orloff is just one example. But stepping back, many of the order's fundamental flaws flow from a single error. They can be traced back to President Biden's call for the FCC to adopt an expansive and disfavored theory of liability, disparate impact, that Congress neither directed nor authorized the FCC to adopt here. And it's interesting, after nearly 
two years and several rounds of comments, the FCC concludes that, quote, there is little or no evidence in the agency's record to even indicate that there's been any intentional discrimination in the broadband market within the meaning of the statute. But instead of proceeding with forward-looking rules on that basis, the FCC, the President's direction, reads this extraordinary theory of liability into the law that exists nowhere in the statutory text. And as I indicate, that creates problems. When you look at how it impacts uniform pricing, when you look at how it impacts credit checks, all of those anomalous outcomes that are being produced by the FCC's reading of the statute are a product of the FCC's erroneous decision to read a disparate impact standard into a disparate treatment statute. Even if the disparate impact was appropriate under the statute, the item fails to follow established Supreme Court precedent for how to structure that type of process. While the order acknowledges the controlling Supreme Court precedent in inclusive communities, it fails to adhere to that precedent, precedent in several respects, which I detail in my written statement. Now, sticking with the Supreme Court for the moment, the FCC's adoption of President Biden's plan sets up another headlong run-in with the major questions doctrine. Nowhere in the statute, nowhere in the one-page text does it provide unambiguous authority for rules that mimic the common carrier regime codified by Congress in Title II. Indeed, a number of senators that voted in favor of the Infrastructure Act recently wrote the FCC to make this exact point. They said the FCC's digital equity rules are not the types of rules authorized by the statutory text passed by Congress. As the saying goes, Congress does not hide an elephant in a mouse hole, yet the FCC finds a whole herd of them in Section 6506. But even assuming the FCC's implementation of the statute were to satisfy the major questions doctrine, the agency's decision still would not clear all of the constitutional hurdles. As I talk about in my written statement, we would have issues under the non-delegation doctrine as well as due process. Now, in a set of late round edits, the FCC attempts to fix some of the problems with today's order. But those last minute changes only highlight the arbitrary and capricious nature of the decision making. One example, the order now exempts the Biden administration's signature Internet for All initiative, BEAD, and the FCC's own Universal Service Fund programs from these new rules. Surprise, surprise. The Biden administration doesn't want to live by the same anti-discrimination standard it applies to everyone else. Is this because the, the Biden administration wants to engage in digital discrimination? Is it because they don't want to promote digital equity? Or is it because the Biden administration is worried that applying these burdensome rules would sink its highest profile internet initiative? It's hard to say because the order itself doesn't explain the exemption, nor does it explain why it makes sense to draw the line where it has. Why single out those two initiatives, but not one or more of the 100 plus other federal broadband initiatives that are being administered today by more than a dozen separate federal agencies? It may remain a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. But regardless, the Biden administration has given away the game. It can't claim that these rules are necessary to prohibit discrimination and then turn around and exempt its own preferred programs. It can't claim that these rules won't harm investment in build out and then turn around and exempt the two broadband initiatives where success matters the most politically to the Biden administration. 
It is obvious to everybody what is going on here. It's not about discrimination. It's about control. Now, I've talked a lot about what's in today's order, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something that is not in it, cost-benefit analysis. And that may be because the order before us wouldn't fare very well under that type of scrutiny. And instead, the order just asserts that the disparate impact standard will not chill investment. But nowhere is there any analysis of the actual cost imposed by and through the various new legal requirements we adopt today. This doesn't reflect the type of reasoned decision-making required by the APA. What's also missing, an appropriate recognition of the government's own decisions. There's simply no administrable way to look at the current broadband landscape and the government's own hand in producing it and then assign liability to a covered provider. Not even attempting to account for that complex role that the government itself has played certainly provides no such path forward. Of course, it didn't have to be this way. Instead of creating multiple vectors of unnecessary litigation risk, the FCC could have adopted an order that lawfully and faithfully implemented Congress's bipartisan decisions in the Infrastructure Act. And the FCC could have focused on broadband infrastructure deployment, on ensuring that every American has a fair shot at next generation and affordable connectivity. As I indicated at the outset, the theme running through the Biden administration's internet policies isn't one of connectivity or capacity, it's control. Finally, I think we can all agree I need to wrap this up soon, an unsolicited word of advice for industry. I understand the Infrastructure Act included some $65 billion in subsidies for broadband. I get it. It's a lot of money. I understand that lobbyists read Section 6506 before it passed and satisfied themselves that it was a limited and narrow provision. I agree, it was. But I also understand how Washington works. There's no such thing as free money in this town. Or as the Wall Street Journal editorial board put it just last week, Industry made a Faustian bargain by supporting this bill. The FCC is now seeking Faust's payment. So for my part, I would simply urge far greater caution going forward. In closing, I remain hopeful that the FCC will correct course sooner or later. I remain hopeful that the Commission will move forward beyond these ideological decisions and toward common sense policies that will deliver wins in the real world. And I very much look forward to voting in favor of those decisions. But today is not one of them, and accordingly, I dissent. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. <clears throat> if you've listened to music at all this past year, you've probably heard the song, Fast Car. The song was first released a whopping 35 years ago by singer-songwriter Tracy Chapman, but was recently covered by the country star Luke Combs. Just last week, Fast Car won Song of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards. Incidentally, I note, making Chapman the first black songwriter to win the Song of the Year prize at the CMAs. It is a beautiful song. I commend it to you if, for shockingly, you haven't heard it. Uh, but one of the most powerful messages in that song, a line that stands out to me as I was reflecting on what I wanted to say here today, comes in the refrain, and it says this. I had a feeling that I could be someone. I had a feeling that I could be someone. And I truly believe that's a message that we stand and deliver on here today. Eradicating digital discrimination anywhere will empower individuals everywhere. This is a proceeding that will impact generations of Americans to come and will work to ensure a more just and equitable future for tomorrow. I stand proud to approve it. In the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a bipartisan Congress recognized 
that the trajectory of digital progress has not always been even, has not always been fair. A result that has held back our collective achievements as a nation. It focused on broadband access as an essential part of that remedy. Congress found that access to affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband is essential to full participation in modern life in the United States and that the persistent digital divide in the U.S. is a barrier to the economic competitiveness of our nation and the equitable distribution of essential public services, including health care and education. This is something that we all should believe. It continued, Congress said, that the digital divide disproportionately affects communities of color, low-income areas, rural areas, and that the benefits of broadband should be broadly enjoyed by all. And so, with those findings, Congress told us here at the FCC to get to work, and that's what we're doing here today. It told us that subscribers should benefit from equal access to broadband internet access service, which includes the opportunity to, subcri to subscribe to an offered service of comparable speeds and other quality of service metrics for comparable terms and service. And to achieve that result, it directed us to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination of access. This is a large and complex item. So I'm only going to highlight a few things that I think are particularly important uh, for folks to understand. First, by including both disparate impact and intent in our definition of digital discrimination, we recognize the multifaceted nature of digital discrimination and take the right steps under the law to eliminate it. Our disparate impact analysis is consistent with the Supreme Court precedent, namely Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs versus Inclusive Communities Project. The court in 2015 stated that a disparate impact legal standard is authorized where the statutory text is results-based and the standard is consistent with statutory purpose. I firmly believe that we have such authority under Section 60506, and furthermore, that we hew closely to the criteria of inclusive communities by limiting potential liability to where the challenge is shown to cause the disparity complained about and that business owners are permitted to explain the valid interest served by the challenged policy or practice. And here's the other point to be said. The alternative, ignoring disparate impact, would have denied Congress's directive to this agency. It is simply not plausible that we could prevent and eliminate digital discrimination by solely, solely addressing intentional discrimination. Second, the rules we adopt here today are not the end of our work. I support the item's various proposals to help guide and support ISP decision makers as they work to implement our rules. Annual reporting will illuminate the many competing factors, of course, that broadband providers weigh in providing service. Our ISPs lead the world thanks to the investment in their networks, and that is about to be supercharged by BEAD and other federal programs. And so now is the end time to ensure uh, transparency into how those broadband providers are going to utilize federal, or federal dollars. Internal compliance as well is equally important. ISP executives must understand the basis for deployment, maintenance, upgrade, and other decisions that they make. These are the individuals who can ensure that non-discrimination of access is a core business goal built by design starting from day one here, just like accessibility, privacy, and security. This information will not, rightfully so, be made public, but creating an internal process for these ISPs is a vital aspect of seeing through the goal. And what I heard repeatedly from stakeholders uh, in this item is that they believe in the purpose of this proceeding and want our goals to succeed. Third, I'm glad that the draft now reflects um, uh, the creation of a safe harbor for ISPs and others that participate in and have adopted policies and procedures consistent with NTIA's BEAD and our Universal Service Fund programs. We heard this clearly from industry, that this is the place that the policy should go. These are 
broadband programs consistent with section 60506 and stating this loud and clear will support ISP participation in many of the programs across the FCC, across the administration that are helping to close the digital divide, reach unserved, underserved, and rural communities everywhere. Finally, I'd like to thank the chair uh, for accepting my request to seek further comment on forming an office of civil rights within the FCC. The record on this is clear. Advocates and industry alike think it's a strong idea. I'm eager to see how the record develops on how best for us to structure, deploy such an office uh, should we go there, as many other agencies have done, from Department of State to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and let me close. This has been a significant work, Chairwoman. Uh, and, and I stand proud uh, of what we're going to achieve here together. It is our collective responsibility to ensure that the Internet address, uh, reaches uh, all Americans everywhere. Today, we fulfill our explicit congressional directive to enact those rules to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination. And in doing so, we are fulfilling our mission. Thank you to the team. I know this has been a significant amount of work for you all as well. You should also stand proud of today's work. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. <clears throat> I have no choice but to dissent today from this order. We all want to close the digital divide. This order will not do so, but will place the Commission in a permanently inquisitorial posture for every communications development or operation project in America. This will chill the field of telecommunications when we should instead be encouraging greater investment and innovation. Under the digital equity rules that we will be adopting today, every business practice or decision by any company remotely connected to the provision of broadband is prohibited unless any disparate impact is unavoidable due to a vague standard of technical or economic infeasibility. This is an impossible standard to meet or to know if you're in compliance with. And as a result, the only way for a company to even attempt to comply is to practice racial, ethnic, and religious discrimination in every business decision. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Commissioner Gomez, coming to us live through the power of communications. <laughs> uh, good morning, Chairwoman, and good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, today, I am participating in this meeting from Cape Town, South Africa, where I am here for AfricaCom. So turning to this important item, we are the rule, not the exception. A friend shared this, sharing, uh, this saying with me last week, and it resonated with me, especially as, as I had the opportunity to reflect about what we are doing here today. Two years ago, Congress came together and passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, investing $65 billion to ensure that everyone has access to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet. And Congress recognized that connectivity for all is the rule, not the exception. Congress also recognized that access for historically underserved communities, communities of color, low-income communities, rural communities, tribal and Latino communities, need to be the rule not the exception, as we make historic investments in our nation's infrastructure that will impact generations to come, as Commissioner Starks just said, we must prioritize digital equity, along with our other guiding policy principles, promoting economic opportunity, competition and innovation, and protecting consumers. And that is exactly what we do here today. We are implementing a bipartisan directive from Congress to facilitate equal access to broadband and prevent digital discrimination of access to communities based on income level, race, ethnicity, color, religion, or national origin. While there are details to sort out, the most important thing is that we start. I want to thank the chairwoman for her leadership in proposing these rules, establishing the task force to prevent digital discrimination, and recognizing the need to bring in experts such as Brad Berry and Lisa Edwards to ensure that we are getting this right. I would also like to thank the chairwoman, Commissioner Starks and Bureau staff for the collaborative efforts to implement changes to commission process and reflect such changes in the draft to address stakeholder concerns about how the rules adopted today will be implemented. Last but certainly not least, I thank the FCC staff throughout the agency that worked on this item. 
Now I would also like to share my remarks in Spanish. Somos la regla, no la excepción. Una amiga compartió conmigo ese significativo dicho la semana pasada y eso me ayudó a reflexionar sobre lo que estamos haciendo hoy aquí. Hace dos años, el Congreso se reunió y aprobó la ley bipartidista de infraestructura, invirtiendo 65 mil millones de dólares para garantizar que to todos en los Estados Unidos tengan acceso a una Internet asequible, confiable y de alta velocidad. Y el Congreso reconoció que la conectividad para todos es la regla, no la excepción. El, con el Congreso también reconoció que el acceso de las comunidades históricamente desatendidas, comunidades étnicamente diversas, comunidades de bajos ingresos, comunidades rurales, comunidades nativoamericanas y latinas, debe ser la regla, no la excepción. A medida que realizamos inversiones históricas en la infra infraestructura de nuestra nación, que influirán en las vidas de las generaciones venideras, debemos priorizar la equidad de acceso a las tecnologías digitales junto con nuestros otros principios rectores de políticas, promover las oportunidades económicas, la competencia y la innovación y proteger a los consumidores. Y eso es exactamente lo que hacemos hoy aquí. Estamos implementando una directiva bipartidista del Congreso para facilitar el acceso igualitario a Internet de banda ancha y prevenir la discriminación de las comunidades en su acceso a las tecnologías digitales según su nivel, su nivel de ingresos, raza, etnia, color, religión u origen nacional. Si bien hay detalles que resolver, lo más importante es que comencemos. Por último, agradezco a todos los funcionarios y autoridades de la FCC que trabajaron en este tema. Thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners. You know, it was two years ago, this very day, that Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. And this law is a big deal. It made a $65 billion investment to ensure that everyone everywhere in the United States has access to broadband. Nothing in our history comes close to the commitment this legislation makes to address equitable access to the opportunities of the digital age. This unprecedented investment in broadband features both deployment initiatives, like the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program at the Department of Commerce, and affordability efforts, like the Affordable Connectivity Program here at the FCC, that has helped more than 21 million low-income households get online and stay online. But Congress knew that more than just this set of deployment and affordability initiatives was needed. That is why in Section 6506 of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Congress directed this agency to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination. This section is the most definitive statement in the law that our work to close the digital divide is not done until we reach those who are unconnected, underserved, and overlooked. It reads, it is the policy of the United States that insofar as technically and economically feasible, subscribers should benefit from equal access to broadband. Now to ensure this happens, Congress directed the FCC to adopt rules to facilitate equal access to broadband internet access service. And what should these rules involve? Well, again, Congress was clear. The law directs us to develop rules preventing digital discrimination of access based on income level, race, ethnicity, color, religion, or national origin, and identifying necessary steps for the commission take to eliminate discrimination. It needs to be said, this statutory language is powerful. It is also remarkable because it represents the consensus of a bipartisan majority of Congress. And today we give these words meaning. 
But before we get to the details, let me tell you what we have done over the last two years that lead us to this moment here today. We built an extensive record through our rulemaking process. We created the task force to prevent digital discrimination, and they conducted eight different listening sessions in places far and wide, including Baltimore, Maryland, Los Angeles, California, and Topeka, Kansas. And at every one of them, we were able to learn from the community, listen to people fighting digital discrimination on the ground, and learn about experiences with industry. We also rechartered the Communications Equity and Diversity Council and broadened its lens, looking beyond media to explore diversity and equity access across technology and communications and the full sector. But the only way we were ever going to create rules that prevent and eliminate digital discrimination, really it comes down to this, is we need to hear from everyone who has a role to play, including state, local, and tribal governments, public interest advocates, and providers. So we took it all in. We listened to communities across the country. We read the record from front to back. And it demonstrated that there are gaps in access for low income, rural, tribal, and minority communities. It showed that the digital divide often tracks the residential redlining that came into existence under the National Housing Act of 1934. It showed that many of the communities that lack adequate access to broadband today are the same areas that suffer from long-standing patterns of residential segregation and economic disadvantage. So back to the statute. The language is broad, but Congress was explicit. These rules have to facilitate equal access to broadband. And as part of this goal, Congress also told us we need to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination of access. That means our rules would miss the mark if they just cover discriminatory intent because we would fall short of meeting our statutory obligation to facilitate equal access to broadband. As a result, we define digital discrimination to include disparate treatment and disparate impact. I believe this approach puts us on the right side of history and the right side of the law. These rules are strong. When you consider that Congress explicitly directed us to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination of access, well, they better be. But I'd also argue that they are fair and reasonable. And let me explain why. We do more than just define digital discrimination. As the law directs, we create a new dedicated pathway for digital discrimination complaints. But we have created a process that is aimed at finding solutions that work for all parties. And if that is not feasible, our Enforcement Bureau will step in with the entire enforcement toolkit at its disposal to seek remedies. As the law requires, we accept genuine reasons of technical and economic feasibility as valid reasons why it may not be possible for equal access to a provider's network. And we're going to review those defenses carefully and thoughtfully on a case-by-case -case basis. But that's not all. We're standing up a process by which providers can request guidance from us to make sure they stay on the right side of the law. On top of this, we also offer guidance to help solve these problems before they ever reach the FCC. That's because the law directs us to develop model policies and best practices for pre preventing digital discrimination that can be adopted by states and localities. So we had our Communications Equity and Diversity Council take the lead developing these best practices, and they are included here in what we adopt today. So like I said at the start, Section 6506 is a big deal. It is the first bipartisan civil rights law focused on the digital age. I'm grateful to so many in the civil rights community who have helped us give it meaning, and I'm grateful for the companies that worked with us to improve our process. I'm also grateful to my colleagues, Commissioner Starks, for his input on developing an Office of Civil Rights, and Commissioner Gomez for her input on creating a point person in the Enforcement Bureau on these matters and identifying reporting mechanisms going forward. In addition, I want to thank a whole lot of staff all across the agency who worked on this effort, starting with Brad Berry, Emily Kaditz, Callie Coker, Lisa Edwards, CJ Ferraro, Jesse Goodwin, Trent Harkrader, Heather Hendrickson, Ed Crouchmer, Aurelie Martieu, Jody May, Jamie McCoy, and Kira Ortiz from the Wireline Competition Bureau. 
Alejandra Roark, Samantha Steen, Duana Terry, and Sanford Williams from the Task Force to Prevent Digital Discrimination. Diane Burstein, Daryl Cooper, Aaron Garza, Susie Rosen Singleton, and Kimberly Wild from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Pamela Gallant, Rosemary McEnery, Patrick McGrath, and Keith Morgan from the Enforcement Bureau. Hilary DeNigro from the Media Bureau. John Blumenshine, David Firth, Nicole McGinnis, and James Wiley from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Susanna Larson and John Lockwood from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Shin Yu, Marlena Barzilai, Michael Jansen, Andrea Kearney, Jacob Lewis, Rick Mallon, William Scher, Anjali Singh, and Michelle Ellison from the Office of General Counsel. Jocelyn James from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. Mark Azik, Stacey Jordan, Eugene Kisilev, Kenneth Lynch, Eric Ralph, and Mac Wakala from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Ed Bartholomew, Chesley Fallon, Jean Kadu, and Steve Rosenberg from the Broadband Data Task Force, and Edward Carlson from the Office of International Affairs. All right. We will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Dissent. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Dissent. Commissioner Gomez. Approved. And the chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item two on your agenda is titled Empowering Survivors of Domestic Violence, Lifeline and Link Up Reform Modernization Affordable Connectivity Program. And it will also be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Trent Harkrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Mr. Harkrader, when you're ready, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a report and order implementing the Safe Connections Act of 2022, which was enacted by Congress just last December to preserve safe access to communication services for survivors of domestic and sexual violence and other related crimes. The item reflects the combined efforts of many across the agency, including fueled by a cross-bureau team in the Wireline Competition Bureau, for whom I am deeply grateful. I'd also like to thank our, co our colleagues in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs, Enforcement, and Wireless Telecommunications Bureaus, as well as the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Economics and Analytics, General Counsel, and Managing Director for their review and incredibly helpful feedback. Seated at the table with me from the Wireline Competition Bureau are Adam Copeland, Deputy Bureau Chief, Ed Kratchmer, Deputy Chief in the Competition Policy Division, and from the Telecommunications Access Policy Division, Jody Griffin, Chief, Nick Page, Associate Chief, and Denise Golombowski, who's the Attorney Advisor who will present the item. Denise, over to you. Thank you, Trent. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Domestic violence remains a significant safety and public health issue that results in tremendous individual harm and societal costs affecting not just survivors, but also their families, friends, and colleagues. More than one in three women and one in four men in the United States will experience some form of domestic violence during their lifetimes. And every year, domestic violence will affect more than 12 million people. Reliable, safe, and affordable connectivity permits survivors to contact family and friends and seek help through services such as domestic abuse hotlines without fear of reprisal. This connectivity can help survivors break away from their abusers and find and maintain contact with safe support networks. Multi-line shared mobile service contracts present unique challenges for survivors of domestic violence seeking to maintain essential connectivity while distancing themselves from their abusers. Such plans can allow the account holder, who may be the abuser, to monitor a survivor's calls and text messages, including calls to domestic abuse hotlines and other lines of support. However, it can be difficult for a survivor to separate their mobile device and service line from a shared mobile service plan, particularly when that shared plan is controlled by the abuser. Furthermore, 
if a domestic violence survivor is considering initiate a communication service of their own or leaving a family plan controlled by their abuser, they may find themselves unable to afford their own service if they are suffering financial hardship. The item before you, if adopted, would establish rules implementing the Safe Connections Act of 2022, taking significant steps to improve access to communication services for survivors of domestic abuse and related crimes. The Safe Connections Act amends the Communications Act of 1934 to require mobile service providers to separate the line of a survivor of domestic violence and other related crimes and abuse and any individuals in the care of their survivor from a mobile service contract shared with an abuser within two business days after receiving a request from the survivor. Additionally, the Safe Connections Act directs the Commission to consider whether to and how the Commission should establish a central database of domestic abuse hotlines to be used by service providers and require such providers to omit any records of calls or text messages to the hotlines from consumer facing call and text message logs subject to certain conditions. Finally, the Safe Connections Act requires the Commission to designate either the Lifeline Program or the Affordable Connectivity Program as the vehicle for providing survivors suffering financial hardship with emergency communication support for up to six months. The report in order before you would adopt rules to implement the line separation provisions in the Safe Connections Act that allows survivors to separate a mobile phone line from an abuser. The rules track the statutory language with key additions and clarifications to address privacy, account security, fraud detection, and operational or technical infeasibility. The report and order would also establish requirements regarding the information that survivors must submit to request a line separation and the options providers must offer when survivors are making a line separation request. In addition, it would set requirements regarding communications with consumers and survivors and provide restrictions on various practices in connection with line separation requests. Further, the report and order would require covered providers to train employees who may interact with survivors on how to assist them or direct them to other employees who have received such training. The report and order would also delineate the financial responsibilities for the monthly service costs and mobile device following a line separation and establish a compliance date six months after the effective date of the report and order. To protect the privacy of calls and texts to hotlines, the report and order would require covered providers and wireline, fixed wireless and fixed satellite providers of voice service to omit from consumer facing logs of calls and text messages any records of calls or text messages to covered hotlines in the central database established by the Commission and maintain internal records of calls and text messages excluded from consumer facing logs of calls and text messages. Providers would generally be given 12 months to comply with these requirements, except that small service providers would be given 18 months. With regard to affordability, the report and order would designate the Lifeline Program to support emergency communication service for survivors that have pursued the line separation process and are experiencing financial hardship. The report and order would direct the FCC's administrator of the Lifeline Program, the Universal Service Administrative Company, to develop processes to allow survivors experiencing financial hardship to apply for and enroll in the Lifeline Program and to transition survivors from emergency communications support 
at the end of the six-month emergency support period mandated by the Safe Connections Act. The report and order also clarifies that survivors entering the Lifeline program will be able to rely on their enrollment in Lifeline to also secure support from the Affordable Connectivity Program during their emergency support period. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench, starting with Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much. Uh, unlike my first statement, I don't have 25 minutes of remarks here, uh, but I do have a lot of thanks and appreciation to express to the staff uh, and to the chair for, for leading on this. You know, this is an area where we take uh, a statute that authorizes us to do this, and we focus in on um, a moment in a person's life that is challenging, chaotic, life-changing, to say the least, um, and something that can seem small, trying to get your phone disconnected, your phone uh, switched over to accounts, and it makes that process just a little bit easier. Um, and that's a really, really good thing, so I'm glad Congress passed this bill. I'm glad that we have these rules that implement it. Um, it has my support. Thanks for your work. Commissioner Starks. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today marks a significant milestone in our unwavering commitment to support survivors of domestic violence, a pervasive issue that transcends race, gender, sexual orientation, a staggering number of individuals, over 12 million annually in the United States alone, live with this truly harrowing reality with one in three women, one in four men, as we heard, experiencing violence in their lifetimes, you know, the urgency uh, to provide timely and effective assistance is more pressing than ever. The Commission's implementation of the Safe Connections Act of 2022 is a critical step. Um, it assures survivors that in that time of need, uh, as we heard, they will have a secure communication. The ability to seek help without fear or risk of being tracked by an abuser is truly a lifeline. Our new rules mandating that providers exclude calls and texts to survivor assistant hotlines from consumer call logs ensures that those survivors can reach out to vital resources such as the National Domestic Violence Hotline and they can have confidence and security and privacy. And moreover, we recognize the acute challenges, of course, that survivors face, particularly where an urgent escape uh, can mean that resources are critical but documentation may be out of reach. And so by integrating temporary communication services into the Lifeline program, we're extending that critical helping hand to those that are in financial hardship. Uh, I'm immensely uh, grateful for the Commission's dedication to this cause here. The, the, the decision here is more than about just access to communication services. It's about truly providing survivors uh, with the safety uh, and privacy that they need. Thank you, of course, to um, many uh, of the folks on the Hill who worked on this, Senator Schatz, Fisher, Blumenthal, Scott Rosen, Congresswoman Kuster, and, and Eshoo for their leadership in passage of the Safe Connections Act. Um, thank you to the staff for the hard work on this important item. It has my support. Thank you, Chairwoman, for your leadership here as well. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I'm happy to support this item that will allow victims of domestic abuse and sexual violence to separate their phone lines from those who have victimized them and to get temporary assistance in paying for those lines. These seemingly minor changes can make an enormous difference for people in the difficult position of having their lives legally and economically intertwined with those who are abusing them and who they are trying to flee. Thank you very much to the staff of the Wireline Bureau and to everyone else whose hard work got us here. Thank you. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. When survivors of abuse and their loved ones are looking for a way out, disentangling their cell phone from an abuser is critical. Today, the commission takes an important step to make it easier for survivors to exit safely. Abuse occurs in many ways, and our action today will provide relief for individuals facing a variety of abusive situations. I would like to highlight the plight of two communities facing specific situations of abuse, farm worker women and indigenous women. Farm worker women report higher rates of intimate partner violence than the general population. Additionally, farm worker women are at particularly ri particular risk for sexual harassment, assault, and rape on the job, 
with a study, study noting that 80% of farm worker women reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment. And especially during Native American Heritage Month, I would like to shine a light on the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls across our nation. A 2016 study by the National Institute of Justice found that 84.3% of American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their lifetimes. In 2022, the National Crime Information Center accounted for 5,491 reports of missing American Indian and Alaska Native women. And according to the CDC, American Indian and Alaska Native women experienced the second highest rate of homicide in 2020, with homicide being in the top 10 leading causes of death for this community. These statistics are devastating. I thank Chairwoman Rosenworcel for incorporating edits into the item that highlight the important role that tribal governments and tribal police departments can play in providing information to substantiate an individual's status as a survivor when requesting a line separation. I would also like to acknowledge that in order for farm worker and indigenous women to be able to benefit from our decision today, we must reach them where they are. For that reason, I would like to encourage organizations that serve farm worker and indigenous communities to help us get the word out. We look forward to collaborating with you so that women in your communities learn about how to request a phone line separation in order to retain their phones as they navigate exiting an abusive environment. Finally, a heartfelt thank you to the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau for your remarkable work on this life-affirming item. And now, again, I would like to share my remarks in Spanish. Cuando los sobrevivientes de abusos y sus seres queridos buscan un escape, es fundamental separar su teléfono móvil del abusador. Hoy, la Comisión Federal de Comunicaciones da un paso importante facilitando el resguardo de los supervivientes que abandonan situ situaciones de abuso. Cuando el sobreviviente de abusos presenta una solicitud, incluyendo toda la, la documentación necesaria para separar las líneas telefónicas, requerimos a los proveedores separar la línea telefónica del sobreviviente de abusos de la línea telefónica del abusador. Las personas que brindan atención a sobrevivientes de abusos también pueden solicitar la separación de la línea telefónica para ayudar al sobreviviente. Los abusos ocurren de muchas maneras y nuestras medidas de hoy brindarán alivio a las personas que enfrentan una variedad de situaciones abusivas. Quiero descartar la difícil situación de dos comunidades que enfrentan circunstancias específicas de abuso, las mujeres trabajadoras agrícolas y las mujeres indígenas. Las mujeres trabajadoras agrícolas reportan tasas más altas de violencia de pareja que la población general. Además, ellas en particular corren el riesgo de sufrir acoso sexual, agresión y violación en el trabajo. Un estudio señala que el 80% de las mujeres trabajadoras agrícolas reportaron haber sobrevivido algún tiempo de acoso, tipo de acoso sexual. Y especialmente durante el mes de la herencia indígena estadounidense, también me gustaría arrojar luz sobre la crisis de las mujeres y niñas indígenas desaparecidas y asesinadas en toda nuestra nación. Un estudio realizado por el Instituto Nacional de Justicia en 2016, reveló que el 84% de las mujeres indígenas americanas y nativas de Alaska han sufrido violencia en su vida. En el año 2022, el Centro Nacional de Información sobre Delitos registró 5,491 informes de mujeres indígenas americanas y nativas de Alaska desaparecidas. Y según los CDC, las mujeres indígenas americanas y las nativas de Alaska sufrieron la segunda tasa más alta de homicidios en, en el año 2020, 2020 y el asesinato es una de las 10 causas más frecuentes de muerte en estas comunidades. Estas estadísticas son devastadoras. 
Agradezco a la presidenta de la FCC, la Jessica Rosenworcel, por incorporar modificaciones a este ítem, resaltando el importante papel que gobiernos de tribus nat nativoamericanas y sus departamentos de policía pueden desempeñar al proporcionar información para fundamentar el estatus de una persona como sobreviviente de abusos al solicitar la separación de su línea telefónica. También me gustaría subrayar que la única forma en que las trabajadoras agrícolas, agrícolas y las mujeres indígenas puedan beneficiarse de nuestra decisión de hoy es acercándonos a ellas. Por eso, quiero alentar a las organizaciones que sirven a las comunidades indígenas y de trabajadores agrícolas para que nos ayuden a difundir esta información. Esperamos colaborar con ustedes para que las mujeres de, los, de sus comunidades sepan cómo solicitar la separación de su línea telefónica para conservar sus teléfonos cuando abandonan un entorno abusivo. Finalmente, un sincero agradecimiento a todos los funcionarios de la FCC por su notable labor en este ítem que ayuda a sustentar vidas. Thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners. Last week, I went to Texas to visit the headquarters of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. I know you think you know strength and resilience, but to see in action those who work at the hotline and the way they take in calls and respond to inquiries, it's pretty extraordinary. They have a steely patience, a deep empathy, and a special skill providing guidance that helps women and men leave violent and abusive situations. Their work is so important. According to the hotline, one in four women in this country is a survivor of domestic violence, one in seven men, too. These are our friends, our families, and our neighbors. Every one of them needs a safe connection. And for those affected by domestic violence, a phone is a lifesaver. It makes it possible to reach out for help. It is a gateway to building a new life away from harm. That is why we are focusing on the connection between survivors and communications. Now, this is new for the FCC. We've never before dedicated our resources to identifying how to securely connect survivors of domestic violence. But in July of last year, we began an inquiry to explore this intersection and ask what could we do. Then Congress stepped in and passed the Safe Connections Act, giving us new tools to address communications for survivors. So in February of this year, we started a rulemaking to put this new authority to use. And today, we adopt the FCC's first ever rules to help with safe communications for survivors of domestic violence. With these rules, we do three things. First, we address family plans. Now, for most of us, family plans cut costs and make wireless communication simple because we've got one bill for multiple phones. But for survivors, family plans are really fraught. They can be used to monitor calls and location. They can be a tool for control. So we're setting up a way for survivors to swiftly and securely separate their phone lines from family plans. Second, we're making sure that survivors can safely call domestic violence hotlines by removing those numbers from call and text logs so they can reach out without fear of discovery from their abusers. Third, we're making sure struggling survivors can receive low-cost phone service through our Lifeline program for six months after separation. Now, these are meaningful changes, and across the board, we appreciate the work of the wireless industry to help make them happen. We wouldn't be here today without the input and support of so many people working to end domestic violence. So let me start by thanking the heroes at the National Domestic Violence Hotline who I had the privilege to meet in Texas. Let me also extend my gratitude to others I met during this visit, including representatives from the Texas Council on Family Violence, Asian Family Support Services of Austin, Family Violence Prevention Services San Antonio, Hayes Caldwell Women's Center, Safe Alliance, and Texas Health and Human Services. I also want to thank many of the organizations we worked with right here in Washington, 
including the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, the National Center for Victims of Crime, the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence Mary Center, and my sister's place. And it was my sister's place that provided my office with the opportunity to spend some time at their shelter, which is a sanctuary for survivors right here in our own backyard. These relationships matter because what we are doing today is a start we want to ensure this community stays in contact with us so that we can make sure our policies work and support the connections survivors need. I also want to thank Senator Schatz, Senator Fisher, Representative Eshoo, Representative Wahlberg, and Representative Custer for championing the Safe Connections Act, plus those at the agency who work to make this possible, including David Brodian, Jessica Campbell, Adam Copeland, Ty Covey, Denise Gomblowski, Jody Griffin, Melissa Kirkel, Ed Krashmer, Chris Locken, Jody May, Nick Page, Mason Sheffa, and Noah Stein from the Wireline Competition Bureau, Garnet Hanley from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Ed Bartholomew, Diane Burstein, Aaron Garza, Elliot Greenwald, Susie Rosen Singleton, Christy Thornton, and Bill Wallace from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Hunter Dealey, Kaylin Lee, Phil Rosaria, and Christy Thompson from the Enforcement Bureau, Melina Barzilai, Andrea Kearney, Andrea Kelly, Doug Klein, Rick Mallon, Karen Schroeder, Anjali Singh, Jeffrey Steinberg, Elliot Tarloff, and Shin Yu from the Office of General Counsel, Mark Azik, Eugene Kisilev, Eric Ralph, Emily Talaga, and Mac Wakala from the Office of Economics and Analytics, and Jocelyn James and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. We will now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approved. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item three on your agenda is titled Understanding Impacts of Artificial Intelligence on Robocalls and Robotechs, and will be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, and Alejandro Roar, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, when you're ready, Mr. Rourke, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today I'm pleased to introduce on behalf of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau an item that, if adopted, provides an opportunity to gather information and prepare for changes in calling and texting practices that may result from new AI influence technologies. Emerging artificial intelligence technologies that can generate and filter content have the potential to benefit the public in important ways, but can also pose privacy and safety challenges. The item before you today initiates a new proceeding to ensure that we better understand the implications of these new AI technologies with the goal of informing policies to advance the Commission's ongoing efforts to protect consumers from unwanted and fraudulent robocalls and robotexts. Before turning the presentation over to the Bureau staff, I would like to thank many bureaus and offices within the Commission who contributed to this work, including the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Office of Economics and Analytics, Office of General Counsel, Enforcement Bureau, Wireline Competition Bureau, Office of Engineering and Technology, and CGB's Disability and Rights Office. Joining me at the table today are Chris C. Thornton, Acting Division Chief, and Zach Champ, Deputy Division Chief of CGB's Consumer Policy Division. Zach Champ will present the item. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Artificial intelligence technologies are becoming increasingly prevalent in our society. These new technologies have the potential to perform tasks that would have ordinarily required human participation and immense uh, promise, uh, tasks that would have ordinarily required human participation and have immense promise for helping combat illegal and unwanted robocalls. For example, they can help but to sift out scams and frauds that have harmed Americans. But AI could also permit bad actors to more easily defraud consumers through calls and text messages, such as using uh, technology to mimic voices of public officials or other trusted sources. This NOI, Notice of Inquiry, would seek to gather information on both the benefits and harms of AI technology, and to ask questions regarding the new privacy and safety challenges such technology raises. The item would do, would do as part of the Commission's ongoing efforts to protect consumers from un unwanted and illegal telephone calls and text messages under the TCPA, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. The item investigates five areas. First, the NOI com seeks comment on whether and if, if so how 
the Commission should define AI technologies for purposes of the inquiry. This includes the particular uses of AI technologies that are relevant to fulfilling the Commission's statutory responsibilities under the TCPA, which protect consumers from non-emergency calls and texts made using an auto dialer or containing an artificial or pre-recorded voice. Second, the NOI seeks comment on how AI technologies may impact consumers who receive robocalls and robotechs, including any potential benefits and risks that these emerging technologies may create. Specifically, the NOI seeks information on how these technologies may alter the functioning of the existing regulatory framework so that the Commission may formulate policies that benefit consumers by ensuring that they continue to receive the privacy protections afforded under the TCPA. Third, the NOI seeks comment on whether it is necessary or even possible to determine at this point whether future types of AI technologies may fall within the TCPA's existing prohibitions on auto-dialed calls or texts and artificial or pre-recorded voice messages. Fourth, the NOI seeks comment on whether the Commission should consider ways to verify the authenticity and legitimately generate AI voice or text content from trusted sources such as through the use of watermarks, certificates, labels, signatures, or other forms of labels when callers rely on AI technology to generate content. This may include, for example, emulating a human voice on a robocall or creating content in a text message. Lastly, the NOI seeks comment on what steps, what next steps the Commission should consider to further, further this inquiry. The Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much. Um, if AI can help combat illegal robocalls, uh, then I'm all for it. Um, and I'm glad to support uh, today's decision. I, I do think using this moment for a second to step back from the kinds of robocalls for a second. Um, there is no doubt that AI and the regulation of AI is what the kids on Twitter would call the current thing. Uh, I think, as best I can tell, Politico editors actually won't let a newsletter or anything go out unless AI is somewhere in the headline. It is, it is all a buzz in D.C. We've got executive orders on it. We've got uh, bicameral interest in Congress. And, you know, look, my, my view is... Um, we need to put some set of common sense guardrails in place. I'm all for that. Um, as a Republican, I, I take more than my fair share of uh, slings and arrows from the right for being too regulatory in some cases. But I think we need some sort of light guardrail. <laughs> too regulatory, too regulatory. Uh, some sort of common sense guardrails in place. But I do worry. I do worry that the path we're heading down is going to be overly prescriptive and too regulatory. If you look at the lengthy 100-plus page executive order on AI uh, that President Biden uh, put out, um, it, it looks like something that I have seen uh, many, many times before over the last couple of years. I, I, I've seen that type of approach a lot uh, when I go to Europe, when I spend time in Brussels. They have a very different mindset in the European regulatory circles when it comes to new technologies. Uh, they study it. They have salons about it. Uh, they want to set, you know, very concrete rules on the front end. And the results sort of speak for themselves, right? You don't see a tremendous amount of tech innovation taking place uh, right now in Europe. It's happened here. And so I think, yes, let's find a middle bowl of porridge. Let's put some common sense guardrails in place. But let's not be so prescriptive and so heavy-handed on the front end that we end up benefiting the large incumbents that are in the space because they can deal with the regulatory frameworks and stifling some of the smaller uh, innovation to come. So uh, my two cents on that. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Thank you. Over the last few months, I've been proud to see our government convene quickly and effectively to explore the implications of artificial intelligence. Congress is, of course, deeply engaged on this issue, convening hearings and introducing bills on the implications of AI uh, on sectors far ranging from healthcare to homeland security. The White House is engaged, uh, President Biden issuing, as we heard, the landmark executive order aimed at seizing the promise and managing the risk 
of AI for the American people, our military is engaged, our scientists are engaged, our agencies are engaged. I, for one, believe this intersectionality is critical because while the future of AI remains uncertain, one thing is very clear, it has the potential to impact, if not transform, nearly every aspect of American life. And because of that potential, each part of our government, I think, bears a responsibility to better understand the risks, opportunities uh, within its mandate, while, of course, being mindful of the limits of its expertise, experience, and authority. And so in this era of rapid technological change, we must collaborate, lean into our learning, share expertise across agencies to best serve our citizens and consumers. And that's what I think the Biden EO charges us with doing, and that's what we're set out to accomplish here today. Specifically, the EO charges the FCC with examining the impact of AI on unwanted robocalls and robotechs. Um, AI technologies can, of course, be leveraged to block unwanted robocalls, robotechs. Wireless carriers use various algorithms for this purpose today. And so we're asking them uh, for that information about that uh, usage here in the NOI. Uh, but AI, of course, also can facilitate, exacerbate uh, scams and calls. One of the clearest examples to date is voice cloning. Generative AI technology that uses recording of a human voice to generate speech sounding like that voice. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, it was the White House's deputy chief of staff uh, charged with developing the administration's AI strategy who said that, quote, voice cloning is one thing that keeps me up at night, close quote. And so this NOI asks about the frequency impact of voice cloning in robotext, robocalls, uh, and how we can address it. Voice cloning, of course, is an already known issue. Uh, I think Donald Rumsfeld will call that a known unknown. Uh, but there are things that we don't know here. Uh, it, it, you know, of course, AI is a powerful, evolving technology uh, we don't know all that it can trigger, and it poses questions that will best be answered in some instances by our regulatees, such as whether AI technology can be used uh, to reduce burdens associated with TCPA compliance measures and how AI can work effectively within uh, TRS. But we also seek information from AI developers, rightfully so, and others who may be less familiar with uh, our regulatory uh, regime here, but still find themselves uh, within them. The NOI, of course, asks how the FCC might cooperate with those developers to ensure they're aware of TCPA's obligations uh, so that they can safe, you know, implement the right safeguards, protect against bad actors. And so thank you uh, as well. A quick word uh, for my colleagues agreeing to my additions at a time when scammers uh, can use tools like worm GPT, fraud GPT, to facilitate crimes, it's critical that the FCC use its enforcement authority to identify what we can about the root causes of AI-driven robocall and robotech scams. And then, as I said earlier, share that information uh, with our fellow agencies charged with addressing uh, malicious, malicious uses of AI. And so thank you for um, the leadership um, by the chair. Uh, thank you to the hard work by the team here. Thanks. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I don't have a, a further statement at this time, but I approve the item. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. As we have just heard, AI technologies can bring both new challenges and opportunities. Responsible and ethical implementation of AI technologies is crucial to strike a balance, ensuring that the benefits of AI are harnessed to protect consumers from harm rather than amplify the risks they face in an increasingly digital landscape. I commend the staff of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau for striking this balance in this notice of inquiry and recognizing the critical need to stay ahead of these developments, I look forward to hearing from leaders in technology, consumers, civil society, and industry as we develop the record in this proceeding. This item has my support. Thank you, commissioners. So if Tom Hanks called, I would pick up the phone. Uh, if he spoke in a way as familiar during that call, I would definitely listen. 
Now, to be clear, the star of Big and Saving Brian Ryan is not dialing me anytime soon, but a video using his voice is on the internet hawking dental plants. None of this is happening with his permission. This is happening because scam artists are playing with artificial intelligence and testing our ability to separate vocal fact from fiction in order to commit fraud. Now imagine instead a call from a friend or family member. Of course you would pick up. Or maybe that voice sounds far off and something just feels wrong. Maybe it's because the individual you think is on the other end of the line is telling you about an imminent emergency and pleading with you to send some cash. Like the hard sell from Tom Hanks, it's also a scam. Because you are not actually talking to who you think you are. You are speaking with a con artist using artificial intelligence to clone the voice of someone you know. If that future sounds far off, think again. We see on the internet already how fraudsters are playing with this technology. We know that scam artists want to explore ways to use this technology over the phone. So I recently had the opportunity to sit down with AARP and talk about the combination of unwanted robocalls and robotexts and artificial intelligence and what it means for consumers. I learned about voice cloning scams, how they're growing, and how they cause special harm for older adults. I mean, imagine, for instance, a grandparent fearing they will get a call from their grandchild only to learn it was a fraudster on the other end of the line preying on their willingness to forward money to family. The anxiety about these technology developments is real, and rightfully so. But I think we make a mistake if we only focus on the potential for harm. We need to equally focus on how artificial intelligence can radically improve the tools we have today to block unwanted robocalls and robotexts. We are talking about technology that can see patterns in our network traffic unlike anything we have today. They can lead to the development of analytic tools that are exponentially better at finding fraud before it ever reaches us at home. Used at scale, we can not only stop this junk, we can use it to help restore trust in our networks. That's why today we're launching an inquiry to ask how artificial intelligence is being used right now to recognize patterns in our network traffic and how it could be used in the future. We know the risks this technology involves, but we also want to harness the benefits. Just like the recently released executive order on safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence recommends. This is not to say any of this will be easy. Like Tom Hanks said, as the ragtag coach Jimmy Dugan in A League of Their Own, the hard is what makes it great. So we have work to do to harness artificial intelligence for good. But I'm an optimist. I still believe that's possible. So let's get to it. Let's see how we can use artificial intelligence to get this junk off the line. I want to thank the staff responsible for our efforts today, including Jerusha Burnett, Zach Champ, Aaron Garza, Josh Mendelson, Michael Scott, Susie Rosen Singleton, Richard Smith, Mark Stone, Christy Thornton, and George Phelan of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Christy Thompson of the Enforcement Bureau, Richard Mallon, Marcus Mayer, Michelle Ellison, Jeff Steinberg, Roy Sherlock, and Wade Lindsay of the Office of General Counsel, Michelle Schaefer and Andrew Wise of the Office of Economics and Analytics, Martin Doskat and Dana Schaefer of the Office of Engineering and Technology, Michael Antonio, Maureen Bisco, Kenneth Karlberg, Sean Cochran, Gerald English, John Evanoff, David Firth, David Saratsky, Austin Rondazzo, and James Wiley of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Jonathan Lecter of the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Arpan Supra and Paul Powell from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. We'll now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Starks? Approve. Commissioner Symington? There's no crying in baseball. Approve. <laughs> uh, well played. Commissioner Gomez? Approved. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item four on your agenda is titled Protecting Consumers from SIM Swapping and Port Out Fraud and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Trent Harkrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Harkrader, welcome back. Please proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Oops. 
Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would establish account authentication requirements and other measures to address two harmful practices that bad actors use to gain control of, of consumers' cell phone accounts and impair their financial and digital lives, SIM swap and port out fraud. It would also seek comment on whether to harmonize the Commission's existing Customer Proprietary Network Information, or CPNI, authentication requirements, and on steps to harmonize government efforts to address SIM swap and port out fraud. I would like to thank the entire Wireline Competition Bureau team for their dedicated work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Commission's Privacy and Data Protection Task Force. Others across the agency who also contributed to this item include Consumer and Governmental Affairs, Enforcement, Public Safety and Homeland Security, and Wireless Telecommunications Bureaus, as well as the Offices of Communications Business Opportunities, Economics and Analytics, and General Counsel. Seated at the table with me from the Wireline Bureau are Adam Copeland, Deputy Bureau Chief, and Chris Laughlin, Deputy Chief of the Competition Policy Division. Chris will now present the item. Thank you, Trent, and good morning, Madam Chairwoman, or afternoon, <laughs> Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. This report and order would address two fraudulent practices bad actors use to take control of consumers' cell phone accounts and wreak havoc on people's financial and digital lives without ever gaining physical, physical control of a consumer's phone. In the first type of scam, known as SIM swapping, a bad actor fraudulently convinces a victim's wireless provider to transfer, or swap, the mobile service and phone number associated with the, the subscriber identity module, or SIM, in the victim's cell phone to a SIM associated with a cell phone in the bad actor's possession. In the second type of scam, known as port out fraud, the bad actor posing as the victim opens an account with a wireless provider other than the vi victim's current provider and then arranges for the victim's phone number to be transferred or ported out to the account with the new wireless provider that is controlled by the bad actor. The report and order, if adopted, would address these scams by setting baseline requirements that establish a uniform framework across, across the mobile wireless industry while giving wireless providers the flexibility to deliver the most advanced and appropriate fraud protection measures available. These requirements would balance the important objectives of protecting consumers from harmful fraudulent conduct while at the same time not impinging on consumers' ability to upgrade and replace their devices or choose their preferred wireless provider. Specifically, if adopted, the report and order re revised the Commission's CPNI and local number portability rules to require wireless providers to adopt secure methods of authenticating a customer before redirecting a customer's phone number to a new device or provider. The report and order would adopt additional rules that reinforce that requirement, including requiring wireless providers to adopt processes for responding to failed authentication attempts, institute employee training for handling SIM swap and port out fraud, and establish safeguards to prevent employees from accessing CPNI when they are interacting with a customer who has contacted the provider until after the customer has been authenticated. The report and order would also adopt rules that will enable customers to act to prevent and address fraudulent SIM changes in number ports, including wireless requiring wireless providers to notify customers regarding SIM change and port out requests, offer customers the option to lock their accounts to block processing of SIM changes in number ports, and give advance notice of available account protection mechanisms. Additionally, the report and order, if adopted, would establish requirements to minimize the harms of SIM swap and port out fraud when it occurs, including requiring wireless providers to maintain a clear process for customers to report fraud, promptly investigate and remediate fraud, and promptly provide customers with documentation of fraud involving their accounts. Finally, to ensure wireless, wireless providers track the effectiveness of authentication measures used for SIM change requests, the report and order would require that providers keep records of SIM change requests and the authentication measures they use. If adopted, the accompanying further notice would seek comment on whether to harmonize the Commission's existing requir requirements gov governing customer access to CPNI and, and the SIM change authentication and protection measures in the report and order, what steps the Commission can take to harmonize government efforts to address SIM swap and port out fraud, and whether the Commission should require wireless providers to immediately notify customers in the event of a failed authentication attempt. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. And you said good afternoon. I think it's good evening for Commissioner Gomez. Um, all right. Uh, we'll now hear comments from the bench, starting with Commissioner Carr. 
Uh, thanks so much to the team for your work on this, and out of respect for uh, the commissioner's bedtime over there, I'll keep my commissioner's uh, uh, my comments <laughs> short. Thanks. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It's a frightening thought that a stranger could successfully impersonate you to your phone company and in one conversation gain access to your primary means of communication. As we heard, these scams, swim, SIM swap, and port out fraud don't just put your account and its access uh, at risk because we so frequently, of course, use our phones for two-factor authentication. A bad actor who takes control of a phone can also take control of financial mm -hmm. accounts, social media accounts, mm -hmm. and the list goes on. And so uh, consumers must be able to count on secure verification procedures and reliable privacy guarantees from their wireless providers. They should be able to go about their day without fearing that someone somewhere might take control of their phone without a single warning sign. And so today we take that action, provide that security. Uh, I'll have a longer statement for the record, but you know, I, I would emphasize that of these baseline requirements, um, you know, we acknowledge two things that the record makes very clear. First, that many providers already do have certain protective measures in place that may fulfill mm -hmm. some of these new requirements. And second, that the threat landscape is rapidly evolving and providers will need flexibility to adopt and adapt their security methods accordingly. And so, um, you, you know, the Commission's statutory duty here uh, to safeguard consumers and their privacy within a, the telecom space a, and relying on the great work of the team here and our unparalleled expertise gives, I think, uh, strength to today's item. So it has my full support and deeply appreciate the work of the team here. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you. SIM swap and port out fraud is a serious vulnerability for consumers. It not only allows people to impersonate the real owner of, of a phone number, but it also allows them to receive private text messages and phone calls and thereby to hijack two-factor authentication mechanisms that are, have become standard in protecting access to bank accounts and other sensitive online services. So I very much support this order that will require mobile carriers to implement reasonable controls to prevent such attacks. I'm especially happy that this order adopts a broad reasonable and a standard for the security measures that those carriers are required to take. This will prevent our rules from fixing into stone current best practices, which are likely to be superseded as cybersecurity advances and so do the hackers. Uh, thank you too to the staff uh, to, of the Wireline Bureau and everyone else who worked on this item. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. Phone numbers are a lifeline. In addition to keeping us connected to our family and friends, our phone numbers are associated with a variety of digital accounts used from everything from banking to healthcare. And now messages sent to our phones for multi-factor authentication are also used to grant access, as uh, Commissioner Symington just noticed, to these accounts that hold so much of our personal information. Through two types of fraudulent activity, SIM swapping and number port outs, malicious actors are able to take over control of a victim's phone, meaning their phone number, without ever accessing their physical phone. Then using this consumer information, they now have it, and this is unacceptable. Today, we take meaningful steps to protect consumers against SIM swap and port out fraud. I want to thank the Wireline Competition Bureau for your work on this item and to Chairwoman Rosen Russell's office for incorporating our edits to ensure notifications are available in consumers' language of choice. And in the spirit of ensuring that information reaches all consumers, I would like to share my remarks in Spanish. Los números de teléfono son un salvavidas. Además de mantenernos conectados con nuestra familia y amigos, nuestros números telefónicos están asocia asociados con una variedad de cuentas digitales que se utilizan para todo, desde los trámites bancarios hasta la atención médica. Y ahora, los mensajes enviados a nuestros teléfonos para la autenticación multifactorial también se utilizan para otorgar acceso a estas cuentas que contienen gran parte de nuestra información personal. A través de dos tipos de actividad fraudulenta, el intercambio de tarjetas SIM y la transferencia de números, personas malintencionadas pueden adueñarse del número telefónico de una víctima sin siquiera acceder a su teléfono físico. Luego, 
buscan la información confidencia, confidencial del consumidor utilizando su número telefónico para lograr acceso a los datos. Eso es inaceptable. Hoy tomamos medidas signi significativas para proteger a los consumidores contra el fraude de transferencia y el cambio de tarjetas SIM. Requeriremos una autenticación del cliente más segura, la notificación a los consumidores antes de que se produzca un intercambio de tarjetas SIM y que proveedores brinden a los consumidores la opción de bloquear su tarjeta, tarjeta SIM para evitar cambios. Agradezco a todos los funcionarios y autoridades de la FCC por su trabajo en este tema y por incorporar los cambios que hemos sugerido para garantizar que las notificaciones estén disponibles en el idioma elegido por sus consumidores. Thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners. If you really want to know something about someone, you really, all you have to do is look at their phone. Because our phones are do so much more than just connect us to family and friends. They are a record of where we have been and who we are. For many of us, these devices are internet gateways to our bank accounts, health records, social media profiles, and more. The convenience of accessing all of this through our phones is undeniable, but it also makes our devices a growing target for fraud, like SIM swapping scams. Now, SIMs, of course, are the small dime-sized chips that are inserted into a mobile phone to identify and authenticate subscribers. And when you want to do something like upgrade your device, transferring your SIM card makes it easy to move your subscriber information to a new phone. But that's where fraudsters step in. A bad actor can call up your wireless provider and convince the customer service representative on the other end of the line that you really need to transfer your SIM card to a new device, a device that is in their control, not yours. And if they're successful, they can divert two-factor authentication messages to drain your bank account, take over your social media profile, and hijack your email. Now, the FBI reports SIM swapping scams are on the rise, but they're not alone because we see it here too. At the FCC, we're getting more and more complaints from consumers who are suffering losses due to SIM swapping fraud. On top of this, the Cyber Safety Review Board at the Department of Homeland Security recently released a report investigating a bad actor responsible for extortion of a mix of companies and government agencies through SIM swapping fraud. The report recommended that we take action to support consumer privacy and cut off these scams. And that's exactly what we do here today. We require wireless carriers to give subscribers more control over their accounts and provide notice to consumers whenever there's a SIM transfer request in order to protect against fraudulent requests made by bad actors. We also revise our customer proprietary network information and local number portability rules to make it harder for scam artists to make requests that get them access to your sensitive subscriber information. We take these steps to improve consumer privacy and put an end to SIM scams because we know that our phones know a lot about us. They are an entry to our records, our accounts, and so much that we value. That is why across the board we need policies that make sure our information is secure. It's also why I created the Commission's first ever Privacy and Data Protection Task Force earlier this year, and I want to thank them for their work on this initiative. I also want to thank Allison Baker, Emily Kaditz, Callie Croker, Adam Copeland, CJ Ferraro, Trent Harkrader, Melissa Kirkle, Chris Laughlin, Jody May, and Jordan Reth from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Diane Burstein, Elliot Greenwald, Erica McMahon, Ike Ofabike, Susie and Rosie Singleton, uh, Karen Schroeder, Christy Thornton, and Kimberly Wild from the Consumer Governmental Affairs Bureau, Moyan Egal, Michael Epstein, James Graves, Phil Rosario, Kimberly Taylor, Christy Thompson, and Shanna Yates from the Enforcement Bureau, Garnett Hanley, Giorgio Slaris, John Lockwood and Jennifer Salhas from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Justin Kane, Ken Carlberg, Deborah Jordan, Nicole McGinnis, Zenji Nakahawa, Erica Olson, and Austin Randazzo from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Garnet Hanley and Jennifer Salas from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Mark Azik, Patrick Brogren, Chelsea Fallon, Eugene Kislev, Eric Ralph, 
and Emily Taliga from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Andrea Kearney, Doug Klein, Richard Mallon, and Derek Yeo from the Office of General Counsel, and Jocelyn James and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And that, now we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, will you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, items five, six, and seven on your agenda are enforcement actions and will be presented by the Enforcement Bureau. Liana Gal, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. So, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Secretary and Commissioners, uh, I, these items are enforcement actions, so we're going to switch the order up. Just as the Commission has done in past cases that involve similar presentations at an open meeting, as with all open meeting items, the Bureau circulated these items to every Commissioner at least three weeks ago, but there's a longstanding practice at the agency that we do not publicly disclose parties of enforcement matters unless and until the commission decides to take action. For these types of items, this means the agency formally votes on the item, then here's a brief presentation from the Bureau before proceeding to any statements that commissioners may have. This process ensures that these sensitive matters will not be publicly disclosed until the FCC has voted to take action. And we're gonna follow that precedent here. So we'll now proceed to a vote on these enforcement actions, starting with item number five, Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. Item number five is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. On to item six. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The items adopted with editorial privileges as requested. And for item seven, Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. Items adopted with editorial privileges as requested. That was repetitive. Uh, Mr. Rama there. Yeah. We're getting <laughs> things done, though. We're moving along. Mr. Egal, please proceed with introducing the items. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Thank you for your consideration and your votes on today's three enforcement items. Notices of apparent liability for forfeiture or NALs against Dexter Blake, Matthew Bowen, and Johnny Peralta for engaging in pirate radio broadcasting in apparent violation of Section 511 of the Communication Act. The 2020 Preventing Illegal Radio Abuse Through Enforcement Act, or Pirate Act, codified as Section 511, requires the Commission to perform yearly pirate sweeps and follow up monitoring within six months in the top five pirate radio markets. The three NALs for your consideration today stem from the first pirate sweep conducted in the New York City market. They underscore the Commission's continuing commitment to curtailing pirate radio broadcasting. With me at the table are from the Enforcement Bureau, Jeremy Marcus, Deputy Bureau Chief, David Marks, Chief Counsel for the Office of the Field Director, and Reggie Bashir's Field Counsel. Reggie will now present the items. Thank you, Loyan. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwin, Commissioners. Unlicensed radio stations, also known as pirate radio stations, operate illegally. They undermine the Commission's efforts to manage limited radio spectrum and pose a danger to the public because they interfere with licensed radio stations that inform their listeners of important public safety messages, including emergency alert system transmissions that provide vital information regarding weather events and other dangers to the public. Accordingly, commission action in this area is essential. The first adopted item proposes a forfeiture of $2,316,000, uh, th excuse me, $2,316,034 against Dexter Blake for pirate radio broadcasting in Mount Vernon, New York. This is the maximum allowable forfeiture under Section 511 of the Act and the commission's rules. Blake is one of the longest operating pirates in the New York City area. Having received an NAL and a forfeiture item from the Enforcement Bureau in 2010 and 2012, respectively, for operating a pirate radio station. 
that forfeiture proceeding warned Blake that future violations would result in increased penalties. Blake never paid the forfeiture. From February 2017 to August 2019, FCC field agents again found Blake's station operating without authorization. The Enforcement Bureau issued three notices of unlicensed operation to Blake during this period, notifying him that his actions violated the Communications Act and that he must cease operating. In February 2023, agents located Blake's station operating again in Mount Vernon, New York. Agents continued their investigation in April and May of 2023, finding the station operating without authorization an additional 19 times in apparent violation of the Pirate Act. Given Blake's history of pirate radio operation, disregard for commission authority, an outstanding unpaid forfeiture, and repeated warnings by the commission, this NAL proposes the maximum penalty allowable under the Pirate Act of $2,316,034. The second NAL adopted today is against Matthew Bowen, the operator of a pirate radio station known as Triple Nine HD in Brooklyn, New York. The station was first discovered by agents during the New York City Pirate Sweep, when agents observed pirate radio station Triple Nine HD operating without authorization in apparent violation of the Pirate Act. Agents also found the station had advertised regular scheduled programming on an additional 87 days during this period including a program operated by Bowen himself three days a week. The NAL adopted by this commission proposes a penalty of $1,780,000 against Matthew Bowen for 89 total violations. The final case involves another long-standing pirate radio station, La Mia Radio, operated by Johnny Peralta in the Bronx, New York. Agents from the New York field office documented Peralta's pirate radio station operating without authorization six times between September 2018 and May 2019, and issued a notice of unlicensed operation. As part of the New York Pirate Radio sweep, agents made observations confirming Lamia Radio continued to operate. Agents also found advertised weekly programming for the station during this period. In total, based on observations and advertised programming, agents found 151 apparent violations of the Pirate Act between September 24th of 2022 and February 21 of 2023, with 98 of these violations occurring within the one year statute of limitations. Given Peralta's history of pirate radio operation, his disregard for commission authority, and his receiving a prior warning against such unauthorized broadcasting, the NAL proposes the maximum penalty allowable under the Pirate Act of $2,316,034 against Johnny Peralta. The Enforcement Bureau appreciates the Commission's adoption of these items and requests the grant of editorial privileges. Thank you. We'll now hear any comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks to the Enforcement Bureau for all your hard work on this. I appreciate it. Thanks. Commissioner Starks. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, uh, to the team here, obviously, for, for vindicating the 2020 Pirate Act here. I've actually visited uh, the New York field office many, many years ago and, and seeing what our field officers do out there and, and helping to keep uh, the public safe here. Thank you, Chief, as always, for the hard work. Has my support. Commissioner Symington. Um, I'd like to also express my appreciation uh, to the team for working on this. And, uh, you know, people talk about the demise of broadcasting, but someone's out there making it work. <laughs> well, if only they had a license. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Gomez. Thank you, Chairwoman. Pirate radio stations violate the integrity of our nation's radio communication systems. They can cause interference to services that rely on spectrum allocated and authorized in accordance with the public interest, leading to the disruption of other radio stations, air traffic control, emergency communications, and more. It is therefore critical that the FCC use its enforcement authority to make clear that our nation's airwaves cannot be used for unauthorized purposes. So thank you as well. Uh, uh, to the Enforcement Bureau staff who investigated these pirate radio stations and drafted these notices of apparent liability. This is important work. Thank you, commissioners. So at the FCC, we are stewards of the public airwaves. To ensure that this essential resource is broadly available, we have rules that govern its use. And for those who fail to follow the rules, there are consequences. In the Pirate Act, Congress upped the ante 
It increased the penalties for those who transmit unauthorized signals over FM and AM radio bands because they can compromise public trust in this service and jeopardize the broadcasting of emergency alerts. So this means higher fines and more regular enforcement sweeps in our largest radio markets. And here, we propose fines against three unauthorized radio operators in New York, and they're the direct result of enforcement sweeps taken pursuant to this new law. They add up to more than $6 million in penalties. They also demonstrate that the agency's field agents are taking their broadcast enforcement duties under the Pirate Act seriously, and that we also take our responsibility as stewards of the public airwaves seriously. I want to thank Representative Velasquez, Representative Rice, Representative Bill Arrakis, Senator Peters, and Senator Daines for their work on the Pirate Act. I also want to acknowledge our former colleague, Commissioner Michael O'Reilly, who championed it. And I especially want to thank the field regional management and agents in our New York field office that they're going to go nameless for their protection today. In addition, I want to share my appreciation for other staff at the agency responsible for these actions, including Reggie Brashears, Loyani Gall, Robert Keller, Jeremy Marcus, David Marks, Ryan McDonald, and Michael Rhodes from the Enforcement Bureau, and William Dever and Dave Conscall from the Office of General Counsel. And with that, let me ask if any of my colleagues have announcements to make at this time. Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Starks. Yes, I do. Briefly, all four of uh, my interns will be leaving by the end of the month. It's that time of the season. Uh, good luck to all on their finals, of course. Um, and just to name them, uh, Vashali Nambiar, a 2L at George Washington University Law School. Daryl Clue, who's here today, stand and be recognized. <laughs> Daryl, thank you for your service, uh, truly. I appreciate all the hard work on behalf of me and my team. Uh, a 2L at Howard University Law School. Uh, Marie Bordelon, a 3L at William and Mary Law School. And then finally, Cheyenne Richardson, a 3L uh, at Howard University Law School and my early career diversity initiative intern. Thank you all. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. None at this time. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you, Chairwoman. I do have a staff announcement today. I would like to introduce Harsha Mudaliar. Harsha, I can't see you, so I'm assuming you're standing up. <laughs> She is. Harsha joined my office. Oh, good. <laughs> Harsha joined my office two weeks ago as a policy advisor. She comes to us from the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. There you are. <laughs> where she served as research assistant for the Subcommittee on Communications, Media, and Broadband. Previously, she served as an intern for the FCC, so she's coming back home in the Office of Legislative Affairs. Harsha received her BA in political science with a minor in information systems and technology from American University. And Harsha will focus on media and technology issues. And I am excited to welcome Harsha to my team. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you. Uh, before we adjourn, I just want to make a couple of announcements. Um, first, I want to share the sad news of the passing of two of our FCC colleagues. On October 26, Maura McGowan passed away peacefully after a long illness. Maura was from Michigan, though she grew up in New Jersey, and she was one of five children. She started her 36-year career with the FCC in 1986. She was a telecommunications specialist at the Office of Engineering and Technology, where she started and she worked for several years, and then later, she joined the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, where she spearheaded statutory requirements of the Regulatory Flexibility Act. Maura's colleagues here at the agency remember her as compassionate, knowledgeable, and helpful colleague with an attention to detail that was second to none. She retired from the FCC in December 2022, and her husband, Tim McGuire, also worked at the FCC for many years in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and he recently retired from the FCC. So we send our sympathy and condolences to Tim and Maura's family. I'm also sad to announce that Carmel Weathers, who was a public servant for over 32 years, passed away on October 25th. She spent most of her career at the FCC as a wireline program analyst, and she worked alongside a whole bunch of attorneys on numbering, network change, and discontinuance issues and what was once the Common Carrier Bureau and we more recently call the Wireline Competition Bureau. 
She worked to help provide network change notifications, and that means she was part of the team that helps providers and consumers with advance warning about service changes. If you want a measure of just how much she contributed to this agency, take note of this. A quick internet search lists Carmel's name as the contact person on more than 4,000 wireline releases over the years. She was clearly the person to call if questions arose. So we express our deepest sympathy to her family, especially her sons, who tell us that she, they always warmly supported her work at the agency. I also have one retirement to announce. For over 11 years, Joe Soresso has been a telecommunications analyst at the FCC. And prior to the FCC, he spent three years at the Department of Agriculture working on their broadband infrastructure program, and before that, more than a quarter of a century deploying infrastructure for telecommunications companies that are both large and small. At the agency, he spent his years in the Wireline Competition Bureau, and is specifically in the Telecommunications Access Policy Division. And using knowledge from all of that past experience, he was known for routinely tackling complex accounting and financial issues. He approached his days vigorously and passionately, and we thank him for his contributions to the agency and wish him only good things in retirement. And with that, Madam Secretary, would you please announce the next date for the Commission's monthly agenda meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. And with that, we stand adjourned. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who didn't receive the advisory, Chairwoman Rosenworcel will be hosting a press conference along with Congresswoman Yvette Clark on Capitol Hill later this afternoon. So we won't be holding her normal post-open meeting press conference, but instead we'll be having, having, have that happen on Capitol Hill. Um, and with that, if you have any questions about any of the items that were voted today, please reach out to us at the Office of Media Relations. We'd be happy to help you. Everyone have a great afternoon. <laughs>